an album couched in as much folklore and myth as almost any other, Fleetwood Mac's Rumors is considered to be their magnum opus. Two years after its release, the band were given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, achieving global stardom and rocketing them all to wealth. Rumors has sold more than 40 million copies over the next 25 years, and not for no reason. It's a production that marked Fleetwood Mac's final transition from a blues group into glittering pop royalty. But what really happened behind the scenes? Infused with heartbreak, affairs, and turmoil, each song tells a different part of the dysfunction that inspired their music. Welcome to Behind the Music. In this video, we dive into what made Rumors into one of the most timeless albums ever created. And stay tuned until the end to learn the irreversible effect it had on each band member. And, you know, everybody was breaking up, and of course that always adds for really great songwriting. In early 1976, when Rumors began recording, Fleetwood Mac had already gone through many incarnations. Having been founded almost a decade earlier in London as a blues band, they had by now released 10 albums, had the band's name appropriated by their record, and were beginning to achieve global recognition. Brits Mick Fleetwood on drums, John McVie on bass, and Christine McVie on vocals remained the only original members from their London roots. Fleetwood and McVie's surnames combined together to create Fleetwood Mac, formed by guitarist Peter Green in 1967. All three of them were former members of John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, which saw other future legends like Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce, and Mick Taylor pass through. From Fleetwood Mac's first album were notable tracks Black Magic Woman and I Need Your Love So Bad, both firmly in the blues genre. They were soon joined by vocalist Christine Perfect, who would marry John McVie and adopt his surname. By 1970, Fleetwood Mac were building a loyal following in Britain and Europe and breaking into the scene in the United States. But things were rapidly falling apart behind the scenes. Peter Green began taking LSD regularly, became concerned with accumulating money, and officially parted ways with the band he had created in 1970. A few years later, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and retreated from public life. In the meantime, his creation Fleetwood Mac were transitioning away from blues and towards rock. This was what led the band to move to California, where in 1975, the band's fusion with pop was guaranteed with the addition of two Americans, singer-songwriter Stevie Nicks and frontman Lindsey Buckingham. With this lineup, the band had the ingredients to achieve global recognition, through an album now in the Grammy Hall of Fame and preserved in the Library of Congress. But the journey wouldn't be easy, and in fact, it's a miracle that Rumors was ever completed at all. The lead-up to the album's recording laid the foundations of its content. In the early 70s, constant touring and John's alcohol dependency had led the married couple, John and Christine McVie, to divorce. That meant that their only interactions were making music. Meanwhile, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks, while still performing as a duo, were having an on-again, off-again relationship, which after eight years was finally coming to an end. The two had been together since they were 16, with Stevie at times working two jobs to support Lindsay's musical ambitions. Buckingham and Nix were only able to put aside their differences to write and perform music. There are clear references to one another throughout the album Rumors, serving equally as each other's muses and targets of criticism. The two had become in many ways the central theme of the band's creative output. In Fleetwood Mac's 1975 album, Landslide was becoming a runaway hit, which was written about Buckingham and the new, more pop-oriented style of this album helped form the direction the band pursued with rumors. Mick Fleetwood had suffered his own heartbreak, with the band's guitarist Bob Weston picking up an affair with Mick's wife, leading to Weston being kicked out of the band. By the time Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, Christine McVie, Lindsey Buckingham, and Stevie Nicks convened in February 1976 at the record plant in Sausalito, California, they were each carrying emotional trauma, most of them with one another. The female members occupied two seafront properties and the men in hillside accommodations. Tensions grew even bigger with the excessive use of cocaine and alcohol, which fueled most of their recording sessions. Fleetwood Mac was determined to fill the album with songs that justified their own place. When completed, four of these would be released as singles. Buckingham wrote, Go Your Own Way, when Stevie Nicks left him. And Secondhand News deals with his feelings about pursuing other lovers grappling with losing Stevie and moving on from their romance. Buckingham says that he never got closure in their relationship and seeing each other constantly after the breakup meant putting aside his feelings to help craft Stevie's ideas into successful songs. Stevie Nicks was writing herself too. Dreams talks about Lindsay wanting his freedom only to regret it later. 
but this song almost never made it to recording. When Stevie came to the band with her idea for the song, they were not too enthusiastic. Christine McVie initially characterized the song as just three chords and one knot in the left hand. Nix had developed the basic idea with a drum pattern and a keyboard by herself, writing the lyrics in just 10 minutes. She was excited about the novelty of dance beat. Taking the rough take that she'd formed, Lindsay did an enormous amount of work to make the same two chords progress into different sections, differentiating from one another and convincing the rest of the band it was a hit. Making things more complicated was that the song was targeted at Buckingham, with lyrics like, Players only love you when they're playing. About the songwriting process, Buckingham said, I was completely devastated when she took off, and yet I had to make hits for her. The Chain, which is the only song credited to all five band members, reflect their vastly different styles of music, splicing together different genres with the lyrics of Stevie Nicks to create a truly novel musical production. Songbird, written by Christine McVie, takes on an even more different tone in the form of a ballad, and the story behind it is just as compelling. Unlike other songs on the album, which went through rigorous transformations and adaptations, Christine McVie woke up early one morning with Songbird fully formed. McVie rushed to her piano to play and sing it with a tape recorder before the thought left her. Of the experience, she said, I can tell you quite how I felt. It was as if I'd been visited. It was a very spiritual thing. I was frightened to play it again in case I'd forgotten it. Unlike many of the other songs on Rumors, though, McVie claims that it was written without anyone purposefully in mind. Instead, it is made to relate to everybody. Soon after, she took her recorder to producer Ken Calais, who immediately saw its strength, developing the idea that they record the song live in a concert-like setting. At the Zellerbach Auditorium, a piano was set up in the middle of the stage, three spotlights from above, and producer Ken Calais had laid out a bouquet of flowers on top of the piano to set the mood. Surrounding the stage were 15 microphones for the recording, which ran early into the following morning. Her bandmates respected the song immensely, with Mick Fleetwood later saying in an interview that the track would be fitting for his funeral. And over the coming years, it became standard for the band to finish their concerts with Songbird. A spotlit, heartfelt ballad may have been part of the album's creation, but it was almost the complete opposite of how the rest of Rumors was constructed. All band members were excessively using cocaine throughout the recording sessions, which they stashed in a velvet bag underneath the mixing desk. Both to fight fatigue and as a way of dealing with intense emotions, the drug was always available. In fact, the band considered awarding their cocaine dealer a credit in the album before he was killed as a result of gangland violence. Recording times were filled with fighting. One of the stories that emerged was Christine McVie throwing a glass of vodka into Lindsay Buckingham's face. And despite grueling sessions that lasted over 11 months, the deadline for the album's release was still pushed back. It was scheduled to be released in September 1976, but finishing and mastering rumors proved intensive. A planned tour was cancelled, which had already sold out to crowds expecting a finished new record. The working title of the album had been Yesterday's Gone, but closer to its release, John McVie offered the title Rumors, based on how he felt each band member was formulating their music. Fleetwood Mac agreed, and the track Go Your Own Way was released in December 1976, earning the album 800,000 pre-release sales. And when the entire album was released, it was met with immediate commercial success. It maintains its position at the top of the Billboard 200 for over seven months, with the singles for Dreams, Don't Stop, and You Make Loving Fun released during this time too. Critics were as impressed as the public, with most agreeing it was a considerable evolution from their last album and one that would guarantee their legacy in the history of 1970s rock. The press was hooked on the drama behind the band's music, each of them becoming subject to tabloid speculation. And the drama didn't end. During the Rumors tour in 1977, Stevie Nicks and Mick Fleetwood, who was still married, had a short-lived affair, largely fueled by their escalating drug use. By the mid-1980s, though, success and excessiveness were catching up with them. Mick Fleetwood filed for bankruptcy and Stevie Nicks checked herself into a rehabilitation program for cocaine addiction. The Rumors band members released two more albums, Mirage and Tango in the Night, but never found the same level of success. In 1987, shortly after the release of Tango in the Night, Lindsey Buckingham left the band, and four years later, Stevie Nicks did too. The Rumors lineup didn't reconvene until more than a decade later when they recorded a 1997 live album, The Dance, 
performing their greatest hits at the Warner Brothers Studios in Burbank, California. And as with many fans, Mick Fleetwood views Rumors as the most important in the band's discography, because it opened doors for all of their musical careers. In 1981, Stevie Nicks released her first solo album, Bella Donna, which included one of her most well-known songs, Edge of Seventeen, and went on to become a successful solo artist in her own right. But none could ever replicate the brilliance of Rumors. The musical genius of each band member and their complicated feelings for one another, topped off by excessive drug use, produced was a collection of powerful, inspired, and deeply felt songs. Even though they tore each other apart personally, they were unable to separate themselves musically by maintaining a deep respect for one another's art. And lucky they did, because it created one of the most memorable albums in history. That's it for this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more in-depth videos that go behind the music. We'll talk to you again in the next one.